Awesome, brother. Well, hey, guys, today we got Jose Samano, who's just made a big change. I'm so juiced on this one, guys, because we've been trying to kind of learn his strategies, and he was one of the elite top maybe 0.01 percenters in the real estate industry. It's going to be a ton of value. And so welcome, brother. Well, thank you for that Thanks, intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. So like, I want to get this out of the way so we can see each other. But so <clears throat> mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about um, like how, how your progression has come. And I think you're pretty innovative in the, innovative in the marketplace. Mm. So like, how, how did you come up with strategies and like really what has been the development of what you've been doing? Okay. Well, I mean, um, I started actually in the uh, lending industry. I started in 2018. Okay. Uh, I was a loan processor. I did that for a while. Um, did that for about two years. And then I went to work for a little company called Bear Stearns. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the Big Short. Uh, have you yeah. guys ever seen that movie? Big Short, I love uh, it. Um, it's yeah. trending right now. Yeah, it's trending right now. Yeah. yeah. I, I was I was, I was was binge watching it on uh, on Netflix yesterday. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I was their, like, 12th employee in California. I uh, was an account manager for them. Uh, this back when wholesaling or yeah. wholesale, you know, wasn't so much retail lending business back in the day. And, um, you know, worked there for about two years. So the recession hit 2008. I decided to start working on opening up a lending company with one of my friends. Uh, he said he had a ton of business. Uh that was bullshit. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he didn't have any business. And then so we were just kind of working through that. Um, and I just started transitioning slowly into being a loan officer just because people really liked working with me. I, I would stay on top of all of the leads and uh, they just really kind of enjoyed working with me. Um, 2010, I decided to open up my own brokerage. Um, and I did that for a while. In 2013, I transitioned into the real estate side. Um, you know, I was a broker at what, 23, 24. Wow. Um, and so like, I always knew that real estate was going to be the thing, you know, once I got bit by the bug, it was just, that's all I was going to do, you know? And, uh, I just don't know how to do anything else right. that good enough, I guess. Um, and so, um, I door knocked, I, um, did, uh, open houses. I, you know, I did one. Um, I, you know, was trying to call my sphere and doing all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, man, if I could only get in front of people, I, I could do really well. Right. And so some uh, a lady, you know, came into my office one day and she was like, hey, have you heard of this thing called Zillow? Uh, you pay them some money and then people call you saying, hey, they want to buy a house. And I was like, no, let me find out. And then so I spent 500 bucks on Zillow my first month, October 2013. Um, my third client, I put him in escrow. And I was like, oh, my God, this works like this is people are just online, you know, and so it blew my mind. And I just started kind of investing more in six months. I was up on my ad spend up to nine thousand dollars a month. Wow. So I was getting about three hundred and fifty leads per month, uh, which is a lot yeah. uh, being a single agent. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just kind of started developing that and really just focused on that end of the uh, of the market. Uh, my bet was is the internet going to be more prevalent in the future or less prevalent? And then, so a lot of times we don't like to do things that are hard because they're hard. Right. right. Uh, and so in the beginning um, it was hard. It was, you know, it was easier to just do open houses and do the traditional stuff. Right. Because online people, you were competing against people. Uh, Zillow in the beginning was giving every lead to like eight different agents. And so we were battling through that process, but that really kind of sharpened my skill set to become just a little bit more of a more skillful agent, right? I was competing every single time, trying to win over these clients that already had referral people, you know, that already were working maybe with a past agent in the past, um, you know, and, and so that really kind of helped me a lot, create processes. Uh, so competition is good, guys, it's not negative. Um, and um, it just depends on how you look at it, right? And so, you know, we're, we're big time competitors. And so we're yeah. always looking at how do we have an edge? How do we get a little bit more juice out of whatever leads that we have? And, and, and so that was kind of like the, the aha moment for me was, hey, online is where it's at. That's yep. where it's going. 100. Make sure you have reviews and all of that. 100. Yeah. So when I got into lending in 2016, mm. I was in the Russell Investment Center in Seattle. Mm. And I was on the 17th floor and Zillow was on the 26th floor. Oh, nice. So I went to the bank. The bank had just opened a mortgage comp, like a mortgage division, mm -hmm. which is how I ended up there. Yeah, yeah. I was working for a guy who built WAMU. Oh, wow. And um, 
So he, I was his first uh, loan officer with no experience. He was, I'm just going to teach you everything. Oh, nice. And uh, he was like, go do this. And I did op- same thing. I did open houses. I tried to buy every realtor coffee and mm. go to title reps, ask for business everywhere. And then I, f- I came, I, I was like, oh, Zillow's here. And then they were like, hey, we do mortgage leads. Like I ran into one of the guys mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, bet. Can I, like, how do I do this? And mm-hmm. he sent me like how to do it. They actually took me out to eat. And then I like, uh, I signed up, it was a thousand dollars and I got my first Zillow transaction on the mortgage buy side leads. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then I, I, I should have stuck with it. As you're talking your story, I was like, damn, I wish I was an agent and I, cause I, I seen it and then I would have bought Zillow leads there. I would be exponentially further cause I would have stuck with Zillow. But when I left the bank and I came back to SoCal, I left Zillow, which is a huge mistake having left it yeah, yeah. for for you i feel like you're a promoter of zillow yeah yeah one thousand percent so it's not even just zillow right it's every single online lead generation company that's out there so you have yeah. ojo you have homelight you have realtor.com realty.com right and all these people are now going to get out of the space they found out that there's a lot of money here yeah so they're not leaving and so you know as time progresses we know that these type of partnerships with vendors are going to be extremely crucial um, Zillow just happens to be the biggest one, but you know, it's, it, it's where we, you know, we've learned so much from them, like on their back end, on, you know, just leveling up our office. They, they make us create all these SOPs and checklists and things like yeah. this to make sure that when they're handing us their leads that they're being taken care of. So it's just kind of helped us, you know, grow as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested to see that one day because we're developing a website called really estate. Mm-hmm. And the guy who founded Really Estates alongside me is he spent over a billion dollars in PPC. He's all he does is he comes from Silicon Valley and he just has a huge company that deals with mm-hmm. uh, pay per click. Yeah, yeah. He really hasn't gone into the real estate space. Nice. His wife got licensed as a real estate agent mm-hmm. and he was like, and that, I mean, I'm great friends with them. And so we're like, hey, let's do this because I've been begging him to do mortgage leads for me. Yeah. And mortgage so, leads are, are tough, man. Like trying to find mortgage leads online. Uh, I haven't been able to find a good resource yet. So we're we're working on that. So like I had this aha moment. So we were bringing in maybe, I can show you on my follow-up boss. We probably brought in like 2,500 leads since April. And nice. we maybe had, we had a good app conversion. Mm-hmm. I have I have that in the links there, but I think we took, we had about a 30, we had a 60 Five percent contact rate. We had about a thirty-five percent to app rate, but then our closing rate was like abysmal. It was probably like funded deals were less than one percent. Yeah. So with online leads, it's tough. You have to have like um. So one of the things that we do in our office is we have an all hands on deck approach. Yeah. So not only do the agents have to make initial contact, the loan officers have to make initial contact, and then we have ISAs that are helping us on the back end after fourteen days of. You know, maybe not communicating, people ghosting. We throw them in our ISA pond, and then they're calling the lead. So, so yes, so that's awesome. That's how I have my leads redirected. So my lead goes into, so it gets zapped into an ISA call center, mm. and then it gets zapped into my FUB, and then the FUB goes into a round robin for all the loan officers. Yeah, yeah. What's crazy is I can't find real estate agents because you guys complain about you guys can't find loan officers to call. I can't find real estate agents to call on cold leads. Yeah, they'll they'll say no. Nah, send it to us when they're pre-approved. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, <laughs> not, not, not in our office. Um, you know, one of the things that we teach our agents is the relationship is more important than the check, right? Yeah. And so we're not necessarily selling like a product that's just like, here you go and you're just exchanging, right? You're like selling pretty much a service that's probably going to be the most expensive thing that they've ever bought. Yeah. And so that comes with a relationship. You're going to have to close them multiple times throughout the transaction process right. just from meeting them, from them, you know, um, you know, getting that second appointment or even showing houses to closing them on getting them pre-approved, trusting your lender, closing them on the payment, closing them on 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 showing more houses, writing the offer. So all of those are just stepping stones to, you know, finally get them there. Right. And so one of the things that we that I, you know, we're big on sports. So we have this thing called uh, we're uh, professional sales athletes. Yeah. Right. And so we use a lot of analogies from sports. And one of them right now is the baseball analogy that I use quite a bit. And so it's like all you're trying to do is get to first base. Like everybody tries to hit a home run. Yeah. Right. So first base is yeah, you know, the singles. Yeah. 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 Just 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 collect singles, bro. Yeah. You'll be good. You know, and then just move them down to second base. If they give you a lob, then crush it, you know, but it's rare to get somebody that just goes to the house and is like, oh, let me write an offer. It's it's more like, 
hey, well, you know, I'm just kind of getting started. I just want to get more information. And, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there to let's do a consultation, right? And then let's figure out kind of what your options are. Let's just kind of get to know you, see if it even really makes sense. Let's pretend to buy a house, yeah, right? So you could take off that pressure. People don't like commitment, right? So, right. Um, you know, that's the reason why there's a lot of touchless stuff, you know, Amazon Prime, you know. Domino's doesn't even want to see you at the door anymore, right? They just leave it at the door, right? Like all these things that are gearing towards the millennial buyer, yeah. which is the buyer that's actually in the market right now. Bro, they're the hardest people to close on the mortgage side. Yeah. They will leave you for four bucks. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, dude, we have a loan officer in Missouri that's going to do this for $3. <laughs> yeah. And You're so that's like, like, the oh, tough thing. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that's tough, you know, obviously because in Missouri, the cost of living is way cheaper. So yeah. people could you know, do one deal a month and be good. Yeah, of course. Um, and so they could cut their costs down like quite a bit. And so I saw that with uh, um, Great Guarantee or something like that, that company, they, they were taking a lot of my loans back in the day. Yeah, guaranteed rate. Uh, yeah. They they have a good they have a good stronghold. It's interesting right now, the mortgage companies, the big banks, how hard they're getting hit. Yeah. There's so many people leaving. There's so many people leaving their mortgage company right now. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, even on the real estate side, you know, it's... It, uh, the industry is moving from a non-professional business into a professional business. And what I mean by that, it's you can't make $300,000 working part-time. Like, yeah. that's just unrealistic. And so if you're able to do that for a little bit of time, that's great. But over time, you're not going to be able to keep that up. Yeah. And so not until you've developed such a big book of business that it's just coming in. Right. And for most people, that's not true. And so, you know, I, I, I tell my agents, it's like, I've had a, I was fortunate enough to be a loan processor and had, had to have a schedule. So I would show up at 7, 7.30 in the morning because funding happens in the East Coast. They're three hours ahead. Yeah. So I needed to be ahead of the curve, right? And so that kind of instilled in me of being in the office and showing up. And I've treated real estate like a job for the last 20 years. You know, and I think that's where, you know, the days of I do real estate part time or I'm retired and I'm kind of going to do it. I think those days are soon going to be over. Yeah. There, I've, I've heard a lot of agents talk about how the team dynamic is going to be the next mm. wave. Like that's the only way to survive. Like the individual agents kind of just going to disappear. Yeah. So we're going back to the 80s, man. I like to tell people. It's like people think that there's all this innovation and there is a lot of innovation happening. But the true core concepts, we're going back in time. Right. And what do I mean by that? So back in the day, the broker was the rainmaker. His job was to make sure that your phone was ringing. Right. Yeah. And so if you have a broker that's competing against you and that's not making your phone ring, then you're not really on a team. Mm -hmm. You're just under a brokerage by yourself. And he has way more resources than you. So, you know, um, I stopped taking any sort of client five years ago. I give away all of my deals to my team. Um, and that's how we've been able to grow our team so quickly. Yeah, that's an interesting model. Like, that's what I've developed here on the lens side is mm -hmm. like, I probably only do like five to seven transactions every month, Yeah, correct. which on the loan side is, is very easy to do. Yeah, yeah. But then everything else I just give to the guys, but all of the marketing goes to the guys. And then what I've been doing now is I've been setting up MSAs where I'll go to agents. I'll say, hey, let's, uh, let's drop four grand in ad spend together. Mm -hmm. I'll do two, you do two. And then here's your agent that's going to be able to call on all the leads. Here's follow up boss. Here's the system that we have designed. Here's your expectations. And now my loan officers have a plug where they can start to actually gain business and grow their business. Yeah. The, the main thing is your ISAs. Your ISAs or, or inside sales agents, you yeah. know, for anybody out there, you know, uh, are going to be probably your, um, you know, your, your your foundation of everything because agents are not lazy; they're just over leveraged, right? Yeah. So it's like I don't like when I hear people say, "Oh, agents are lazy." I don't I don't think they're lazy. It's like they have to be the TikTok guy, Instagram guy. They have to do reels. They gotta do open houses. They gotta do fizzbos. They gotta door knock. They gotta send out flyers. They gotta do EDDM. And it's like, when do they get to be in front of clients and actually talk to clients and actually move forward? So what we do is we just peel back the onion, right, and try to take off as much as we can from the process so the agents don't have to do that. Yeah, so then you have ISAs just setting appointments and all they got to do is set up their appointments. Yeah, I mean, we still want the agents calling, right? Right. It, it, it's for the sake of practicing, right, keeping it sharp. Like, 
you should feel like you're Kobe Bryant and every time it's the fourth quarter and you're you're getting the ball. Like, I don't want anybody calling. You know, I don't want my ISAs calling. I, I want me calling, but I right. know I don't have enough time to be able to do that, so i got to leverage. With with your ISAs, when, they, when they're calling, are they calling and saying, like, what's, what's, let's go back. With your ISAs calling, how many times, let's say in the first seven days, are they calling your lead? Do you have an action plan already preset or are they just – Kind of getting the jump ball and saying, okay, let's let's just call on it as we see fit. So, yeah, so the ISAs are just kind of going through uh, a, a routing. So most of our leads are from Dillo, um, all of our newer leads. Some people have open house leads and, and things like that. So about 35% of our business is Zillow. Um, the rest of it is from Sphere, from repeat customers, from referrals. Because that's another thing about Zillow, right, that um, most people think like Zillow's like, you're not going to make all your money on Zillow. You make your money on the on the second deal, on the right, third on the deal. deal. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of where you make your money. And it's also a way to build your book of business very quickly. So we've, uh, you know, Jeff, my partner, uh, shout out to Jeff. Um, he, uh, his first year, he did 36 transactions as a real estate agent. That's incredible. Second year, I think he was somewhere around like 40, man. Like he was like 60 something transactions, two years in the biz. So by his third year, he started receiving referrals, right? Because on average, people live in their first home for three to five years right. in California. So by, you know, now he's getting people that are saying, hey, can you sell my house? Right. And he doesn't even market to listing agents or, or for sellers or anything like that. And so that's what I tell people is like, I didn't start selling houses till 2013. And I've sold over 700 homes, right? And I didn't really start getting into Zillow. Like I started getting into Zillow like really, really, really like 2016, 2017. That's when I really started understanding how it worked and how I needed a team to be able to help me because I wasn't going to be able to do it on my own. That's wild. And then so going back to your question as far as ISAs go, um, because we do get an incoming call, our ISAs don't get triggered until, you know, I would say after seven or 10 days or once the lead starts getting ghosted or an agent's not necessarily performing on, on the lead for whatever reason. Um, we used to have a minimum call uh, that we want an agent to do, but I just tell agents, you know what, just use your best judgment, right? Um, there's a book called uh, No Rules Rules by Netflix, um, and it talks about how the more rules that you create, the more uh, micromanagement you have to do. So if you start allowing people to be able to make a decision on their own, most people are going to make the right decision. So, you know, that's what we tell agents. Hey, look, figure it out. If you feel like you need to make more phone calls to this client, make more phone calls. If you feel like it's a waste of time, then toss it to the pond and let's have one of our ISAs hit that lead or, you know, one of our ISAs or one of our other agents or, again, one of our lenders that's in the pond calling leads. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you set expectations for your lenders? Yes. Yeah, so there's an expectation from our lenders. Um, you know, we're slowly raising that. Uh, that bar. Yeah. So we start off at uh, 125 calls. So before you even get into our office, uh, a lender will have to make 1,000 phone calls. So you have to make 1,000 phone calls. We have a training that we do. And the 1,000 phone calls is to make sure that you you can complete a task is one thing. Yeah. That, that, uh, so that's, that's one thing that's important. The other thing is that we want to know how you sound on the phone and if we can help you work on some of your techniques or things like that. Um, and we also want to gear you up towards, like, you got to dial. So yeah. if you're not dialing, then what are you doing, right? And so it's all about the activities, and, and it's going to take massive action to have results. Right. Especially in today's market, right? So I, I tell the agent sometimes they go, "Hey Jose, well, I don't like making phone calls." And I'll say, "Okay, well, you don't like making phone calls, so what do you like to do?" I like to do open houses. Okay, cool. So how many open houses are you gonna do a week? And they're usually like, "Well, like I'll do one like every two weeks." I'm like, "How how much success do you think you're gonna have if you're doing an open house every two weeks?" And that's your sole way of being able to get leads, you know. So you're gonna have to probably do six or seven open houses every two weeks, maybe 14 open houses a month in order for you to be able to get to, business because yeah, you're yeah. not going to be able to to work with every single one of these people. And because all of the people that are online that, you know, you're starting to see when people go to open houses, they've already been speaking to an agent. Yeah. They've already have built a relationship with these people. And so if you're not like really good at your scripts, if you're not, um, you know, if you can't deliver value from a standpoint of educating the client or, you know, giving them free advice on certain things that they can benefit from, it's, it's going to get really hard. Yeah, that's that's interesting. 
I did a first open house in years because it was my brother's listing. Mm -hmm. And so I had to cover him for a day. Not only did I have to put out signs in a suit, which was frustrating, mm -hmm. but then I was in there and I was talking to people and, you know, I got a couple loan leads and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is an interesting model that people can probably leverage. And there was like uh, one of the gals there that walked in, she had nobody. And I was talking to her and I was like, oh, you want to list? You want to buy? Okay, cool. Let me get you back to my brother and see if, uh, see if he can list your house so you can put a cash offer on this one. I'm sure if he does a whole transaction, you got a, a good insight. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess she had an agent because the next day I got a call from somebody that was real upset that I was trying to poach your client. And it was like, my, my conversation was like, well, they shouldn't have been there by themselves. If, if you have a list buy side client, that client's worth about 26,000 at a $700,000 price point. That's not worth a, a day on the on the road. Yeah, I know. I don't feel bad for for agents that get their clients because it's not your client, right? Uh, people say it's their client. It's not their client. You know, it's a prospect. It's a hot prospect. It becomes your client once you either sign a buyer's agency agreement or once you write an offer. That's when it becomes your client. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we teach the agents too. It's like when I ask them like. How many clients do you have? They're like, oh, I got like 14. I'm like, okay, so you have 14 buyer's agent agreements or you're writing offers on all 14 of them? And they're like, no, 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 no. It's just somebody that I'm showing houses to. I'm like, that's not your client. Yeah. This guy's out for the streets, you know? And so if you send a client to an open house, I mean, what happens on new construction? Oh, the builders get them. Yeah, they don't, nobody says anything, right? Them. Yeah, and we're, nope. so, yeah, brother, when you go to, when you go to no build, they take everything, man. Yeah. Yeah, they take everything uh, almost uh, almost as like as they should, right? Yeah, it's like if you know one of the things I I uh, <laughs> you know I pose a question a lot of times when I'm at an open house. Obviously, like you know, I respect if they're already working with somebody, right? Yeah. Hey, if you're already working with somebody, you're committed to them. You have a buyer's agent agreement. Obviously, you know you're fine. But um, this is where the competitor comes out, right? Yeah. And then it's like, hey, well, let me ask you a quick question, you know. Um, um, you know, like I'll say something like, you know, why, why weren't they able to make the appointment? You know, is it just, they're a little too busy and usually somebody, yeah, you know, they're a little busy, they're with family and they're, they're doing this and they're doing that. And I'm like, so they told you to go out and go look at homes on your own. Yeah. Right. Like you should probably partner up with somebody and be like, Hey, could you go out and show houses? That's what we yep. do in our office. Right. That's the, the, that's a team. That's yeah. a team dynamic. Taking yeah. it right back. Yeah. And then, so like 90% of all of our deals in our office are partnered up with people. That's awesome. Right. And then, so whether it's a success coach or another agent in our office, um, and, and it's like, well, let me ask you, you know, part of being a real estate agent and being in a transaction is going to be time management, right? Cause yep. you have deadlines and things like that. So if your agent doesn't know how to manage his time for him to be able to be here at this appointment, how is he going to manage your transaction? Right. And again, it's not trying to poach. Again, it's not your client. A client becomes your client once you get into escrow or once you, you sign a buyer's agent agreement. Right. Right. So if you don't have a contract and you don't have any of that. And unfortunately, it is what it is in California. It's not something that a lot of people practice. You know, we don't practice it too much. There's certain instances that I do uh, sign a buyer's agent agreement, specifically where larger, larger like price points. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important, especially with the online marketplace. For the real estate agents to get it signed. We can't do it on the lens side. They, yeah. They'll shop you till you're at close. Yeah, but it's very difficult to to get a, a buyer's agent agreement signed because, like, unfortunately, agents are wishy-washy, right? Um, and I'm including myself in that. Like, uh, there's been times where I've dropped the ball on a deal and I haven't called somebody back and, you know, whatever, right? And and, it, and it's like, you know, how are you going to hold somebody hostage? Like. Yeah. I've learned from like online leads like Zillow and Open Door and you know just these listing platforms that are out there that you know Redfin is offering no agreement cancel any time 1% to list your house right and then so it's like as a listing agent how do you compete against that how do you compete against a massive team like that and and then so you know we started gearing ourselves towards that too so I you know will sign a 30 day listing agreement Right. If I'm doing a home, depends on the situation. But yeah, if somebody's getting my basic package um, where all I'm doing is taking some photos and listing the property on the MLS, um, yeah, I, I, I do a 30 day listing agreement, cancel any time. And what I tell the clients is, 
hey, if anybody comes in here saying that they need a three to six month listing agreement, they're already telling you that they can't sell your house. Yeah. So like, that's not what I need. I just need two weeks, three weeks on the MLS and boom, we're done. Yeah. No, I love that. I wanted to, I wanted to practice on, on my brother's listing. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. Like, cause I have a DRE license cause I'm about to become a mor mortgage broker. Okay. Nice. And so I was like, let me, um, let me do all the back end for you. Let me, yeah. let me help you out. Yeah. And so I, I set up pictures, marketing. I hit up Jaden. I was like, Jaden, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. Mm -hmm. I hit up my boy over at, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but basically we can take a listing Mm -hmm. And then he has a proprietary software that's going to text about 2,000 homeowners in the surrounding neighborhood to mm -hmm. let them know that we got an open house, we got a new listing. Correct. And it's going to give them a link that they're going to be able to click on to be, then it takes them into a lead funnel. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to get their information. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're Galileo. The yeah. Software's Galileo. Yeah. So when you're texting the people around the area, I tell people, it's like, you're not texting them so they can buy the house. You're texting them to show off your open house and how great you do at marketing yeah. so they can then list your house with you. Only 3% of the neighbors are actually going to buy the house. Yeah. Everybody else is going to be online. Well, and then I, what I've realized is through this experience, this has been a great experience for me to see kind of what, mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah. This is his first listing. Nice. This is his first time ever doing anything like that. And so I wanted to like coach him and help him out. But for me to see it all in lifetimes, I was like, Okay, so the next piece of the marketing is going to be we're going to set up flyers. We're going to flyer the entire neighborhood mm -hmm. with just sold with a QR code that says scan in for more information and get your your free um, home home analysis. And then I'll just link it to HomeBot and then HomeBot can then push it out. Yeah. And so then it'll be it'll be an easy way for him to start growing his business off of this one transaction. Correct. And I was like, man, this isn't that hard. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, what it is, is creating the processes. And so most, um, I could tell you again, shout out to my boy, Jeff. Uh, he, um, you know, he has a, his way of thinking is more like operational. Yeah. So he's, he's more about creating systems, SOPs and things like that. I'm more of like the gunslinger, right? Like yeah. just, I just do it. Right. And, and then, so, but his way is much better, right? So he just breaks everything down and creates systems so he doesn't have to do it. Yep. And and then so, um, you know, like we have our VAs doing all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, besides the flyering, uh, but we're making phone calls, we're sending out text messages on every single listing on behalf of the agent. Right. So, um, you know, one little cool tool that I can give you um, is uh, Showing Time Plus. So Showing Time Plus has something called Listing Media Services, and they take photos, they do 3D tours, uh, they do, you know, Twilight, social media marketing as well. And so they give you an entire package, uh, and, it's, and, it's, uh, and it's done through Zillow. Right. So Zillow owns Showing Time Plus. Um, and so they know exactly what it is. Right. So I would say about five years ago, you know, it clicked like, hey, these companies are marketing companies. They're not necessarily selling real estate. So what do they care about? They care about the consumer experience. Right. Yep. So customer service. And they care about like how much time the consumer is spending on the site. Right. Because that's how they sell me the leads, right? That's right. how that's how I'm able to do that. So um I started focusing on content on every single pick on every single property. So I do 35 photos plus on every single house. I do a 3D tour on every single house. I do a video on every single house, regardless of the price point, regardless of how nice the house is, that doesn't matter. That's that's my process because it allows me to really um weigh that property, I guess, up. Right. Because right. now Zillow's like, oh, my God, there's a lot of people that are spending time and I'm sure their algorithm like I'm not I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure that they are wanting consumers to spend more time on their site. And they take 100 percent. They want people on their site. Yeah. Yeah. The more that they're on there, the better it's going to. Yeah. Be. So the more photos you have, the more things that you have. And another little tip is understanding the new consumer. Right. Which is the millennial consumer. So you're super successful, bro. You're like killing it on on Zillow and you're killing it with EXP. Yeah, I'm sure you had a massive downline. I had about 160 people. So so what happened when you said, okay, what what could have been so enticing that you said, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the EXP model, I'm gonna go to real? Well, um, to be honest with you, it's we we didn't necessarily leave the model, right? Like um we love DXP. Um we still do shout out to EXP. You guys do uh, you know, we're very innovative in the way of, you know, um, you know, Hiller Williams was the first with uh, rev share, right? Uh, but they were doing more profit sharing. Yeah. So once once they came into the picture and they started doing really pushing the agent network marketing space uh, and creating revenue share, 
you know, just totally makes sense. You know, yeah. agents are always trying to double end every transaction. They're trying to become a lender. They're trying to be the escrow officer, notary. They, some of them even try to do the photography, right? Yep. So they're trying to figure out multiple ways to be able to kind of make money on these deals. So um, we, we really enjoyed our experience at eXp. We learned a lot. Um, but there was a few things that we wanted to um, experience. One of them was, um, you know, being able to have um, a little bit more collaboration between the influencers or recruiters and the actual producers. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, people, um, you know, within the EXP space, you know, they're kind of being labeled as just recruiters, right? Right. Um, and, and the reason for that is... It feels it's, like they're selling Mother Luca sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and the reason, it, and it's not everybody. Okay. Right. So I don't want you, you know, for me to be making a blanket statement, like, um, but, but for me, every recruit comes with a certain sense of responsibility. Um, I understand that the platform at EXP, if you utilize like the online platform and the world and all of that, which is amazing, the world, I love the world. Uh, we were, we will live there all the time we were doing our trainings in the world through like virtual and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it, the, the, all that kind of stuff really, really, really helped, but, um, there wasn't a way for somebody like me who focuses a hundred percent on production, uh, to be able to work with people that weren't in my downline. Right. And so at real, um, collaboration is, 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 is super cool. And they have something called co-sponsorship. So whether you're in my downline or not, we could co-sponsor on deals on, on our agents that you're bringing to the table. So let's say you're a recruiter, you could just utilize my office and my facilities and everything that I have to bring to the table to be able to support the agents that you're bringing on, right? Because agents still kind of need, you know, real life experiences to learn how to do real estate. You don't learn real estate, you know, by just looking at videos online on YouTube. I mean, you could get a lot of insight. You could get a lot of stuff. But the real world is what's really going to teach you how to become a real estate agent. Wow, so, I love that. Yeah. So what are, what are like the top three things that you see that real is doing different? So you said the co the co the co sponsorship. Co -sponsorship. What are some of the two other aspects that you see that are are, yeah. are really game changers? For me, it's like um, also you know there's a lot of freedom in the compensations that we're able to create. Not all compensation plans like you know. Uh, can, you have to be a little bit more aggressive in certain states, you know, especially in California. Yeah. Uh, you got to be a little bit more aggressive, especially with right now, um, you know, there being uh, compression on commissions, commission compression, right? Because now you have these giants in the business and they all want 35%, 40% for every lead that they're giving you. I mean, that's right. a great model, right? Um, and so that was another kind of thing that at EXP we didn't have too much control of. There's certain, you know, things that you have to do, but like I mentioned, you know, uh, I love DXP. We were the number five team in all of EXP at a certain point. Uh, and so we were super excited about the platform and, and everything. And so, I mean, so much so that we went to a very similar company. Um, but we have a little bit more, let's just say, a little bit more say um, in, in, in what we're doing and what we're trying to do. And for us, is all about collabing. Uh, it's all about regardless of whether I'm your sponsor or not. You know, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, we were actually one of the first teams at EXP to allow anybody in our office, regardless of your sponsorship. Um, not too many teams were doing that at the time. I'm the first one that I know of because uh, at inception of our office, we started doing that. Um, you know, we just really kind of believed in, you know, we're all in this together type of thing. That's incredible, man. Yeah. 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 And, it's very rare to see that most of the time it's just like, Hey, you're either in our inner circle. Sometimes I see like our industry, a little culty, right? Like we're, mm -hmm. this is ours. Yeah. I, I try to do something similar on a very much smaller scale with the lens side where I've really developed a team and a, like a cohesive environment. So like, if like right now we're doing this, if mm -hmm. I have loan issues and they're calling Samantha, Manuel could work on a loan or William could work on a loan or mm -hmm. Horacio can work on a loan. Yeah, yeah. Any of my guys and now Aaron who just joined our team, they can just go ahead and work because we all share within the pot. We all share within the leads. We all share within everything. And we're all in it together. So like, you know, like you said, oh, any lender that wants into our office would get a thousand calls. It'd be like, oh, well, we have seven people that are going to start dialing. Yeah. Right. And that's that's really the uh, that's really what we've been trying to promote is like in this group that I've created is just like, no, there's culture first and then there's profit second. But like if you build a good culture Profits just come. Like yesterday, I recruited two new loan officers. 
I wasn't even trying. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've never wanted to recruit. I, it's just happened organically where people have come to me and said, hey, I want to be a part of your team. And now it's like, okay, well, I think I'm going to start to to grow this model a little bit bigger. Yeah, well, people talk about agent attraction, right? But, you know, you're not attracting them if you're chasing them, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, you know, ninja, you know, pull, don't chase, right? Yeah. Uh, and then so you want to be able to create, like, this magnetism of, like, production because production leads to recruiting right so that's a hundred percent of our focus it's how do we get our agents to produce more right and so one of the things that we learned with zillow it's like figure out who your audience is first right so we figured out our audience is our agents it's actually not our clients necessarily you know our clients are a byproduct right but for us as a broker yeah your our client is really the agent yeah really yeah. the agent and it's like so what problems am i going to solve for them Right. It's really kind of where it comes down to. And so if you're working, let's say, at a brokerage where nobody thinks like that, then you're just going to be stuck with having all these problems and all these issues. And you're not going to be able to keep up with the speed that you need to work at in today's environment. So uh, we're always thinking about what problems can we solve for our agents so they don't have to go through that anymore. And we can really kind of figure out a smooth and you know, dialed in process where everyone is having the same experience as a consumer, right? Rather than, you know, one agent so having a Ford assembly line. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so you, you know, I, I hate that term, right? Because we still want our agents to go above and beyond. So to add their own little, you know, sauce, right? right. Their own little drip to it. You know, I always say it's not in the script, it's in the drip, right? Um, and so you still want to internalize everything. You still want to make it your own experience. But at the same time, there needs to be a certain base level of what the consumer should be expecting every single time. Interesting. I love that. Yeah. What do you when you're talking about your consumer experience, you talked about spotlight. Mm -hmm. What are some of the what is something that separates your agents on the buy side when they're representing? Like what is what is something that you've created that says this is different than everybody else that we really value as a part of our process? Cool. So like First things, um, you know, for the agents out there, you you have the ability to create every relationship. And it's you that's creating whether the client is going to be working with you or not. It has nothing to do with the client, at least in my perspective. So what do I mean by this? So as soon as I get off the phone um, with the client, obviously my script, hello, my name is Jose Samano. I'm your Zillow Premier Agent. I understand that you're interested in 123 Main Street. Would you like to tour that property today? It's always today. It's not when, because when we'll give you next week. After three days, your appointment met rate drops to almost like zero, right? So they're going to ghost you. So you always try to meet people right away. Oh, that's cool. Right? And then, you know, you, uh, you introduce yourself with your name and you finish with your name as well. As soon as I get off the phone, I'm sending out a text message. Hey, you know, it was a pleasure chatting with you. It's Jose. If I... You know, typically what we instruct our agents is, hey, create a video. So if you talk to somebody, you want to create a custom video, right? That way it feels original. It feels like them. Talk about some of the things that you talked about on the phone. Hey, I'm going to look for other properties that are in the area that are similar, that have a pool. You know, I look forward to meeting you, blah, blah, create that instant connection. I like to say, you know, I'm going to give you a call back in the next five to 10 minutes just to confirm this appointment, right? The reason why I make it such a short timeline um, it's because I'm trying to teach the client that this is the way that I communicate. So I like to work with clients that communicate well with me and that follow my direction. So I read this book uh, inked by uh, Jeb Blunt that was talking about um, micro agreements. And so back in the day with Tom Hopkins, you know, people used to do the, hey, do you mind holding on a yes. second? Yeah. Could you grab a pen? And paper? Yeah, it's getting them to say yes. Yeah, yeah, right? And then so a lot of the times, too, when I send out my first initial text, I'll say, hey, could you please favorite this text so I know that you got it? So I'm already giving them direction, right? So if they like it, I'm like, all right, cool. This guy's already kind of following my direction. If I call back in five to ten minutes and they pick up, they're following my direction, right? Um, one of the things that people come across is like, well, what if the listing agent doesn't pick up? It doesn't matter if they don't pick up. You're not doing it for the listing agent. You're doing it to cement this relationship with the client so they know the type of person that you are and how you work, right? So that's the priority. Again, first base. Yeah, right? love that. It's not second base, not third base. Yeah. We're, we're just sticking to first base, right? And then so, um, you know, I'll tell the, 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 the client when I call them back, I'll say something like, hey, you know what? Um, 
unfortunately, we weren't, uh, I haven't been able to get in touch with the listing agent, but, uh, you know, do you mind giving me another 15 to 30 minutes? And then I'll give you another call back just to confirm this appointment, right? They'll usually be like, oh my God, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Give me a call. So I'll wait 30 minutes. Let's say I call them back. If I was able to schedule the appointment, hey, congratulations, I was able to schedule the appointment. I also found other similar homes around the area. That way you could compare and contrast and just get a better feel for the neighborhood. Because just like test driving a car, you want to test drive multiple cars if you can, because that's going to give you a higher opportunity at writing an offer right away. Right. Um, and so th th that's kind of like part of my process. Um, if they still don't pick up in 30 minutes, I'll tell the client, hey, do you mind giving me until midday or do you want do you mind giving me until end of day for me to call you back to, uh, you know, confirm this appointment? And let's say I call back again and I still haven't been able to, um, you know, make that appointment with the with 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 that listing agent. I'll say something to the effect of like, hey, well, look, I'm still trying to get in touch with him. In the meantime, we're going to keep this appointment. I'll go ahead and um, schedule other properties. If I do get a call back from him trying to schedule this one, then we'll go check out this one as well. Wow. But now in a time span of what, an hour maybe, I have sent my name once, twice in the text when I called back and on my other callback. So five times in like 30 minutes. Wow, that's incredible. Right. What, how, how do you time the speed to lead? Like what's your average time lead comes in? You're on it. Is it instantaneously because of yeah. the calls or do they drop a text message? Correct. It's instantaneously. It's instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. It's because it's a live connection. Oh, I love that. So with with um, other lead sources, well, I mean, we're trying to stay under five minutes. Okay. I mean, obviously, you have all these tools with like AI and stuff like that, and we have all of those. So, I mean, if you're talking about that, then, you know, our speed to lead is like three seconds, two seconds, right? Yeah. Um, but as soon as that text gets sent out, uh, uh, an ISA you know, supposed to contact that lead because we have different lead sources, right? So if it's not a bottom funnel lead, meaning that it's not somebody that's trying to create an appointment, we don't really want our agents calling that. We gotcha. want the ISAs calling that. That's interesting. Yeah. Dude, you gave me so many nuggets for how I'm going to set up my lead system. Yeah. One, you convinced me that I'm going to have to hire a full-time in-house ISA because yeah. right now I have it to a third-party system. But the best, I think the best nugget I just took is I'm going to set up my, my initial conversation and I'm going to inject them say, Hey, are you ready to be pre-approved today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Are you ready to be approved in this conversation? Are you ready? And that's, I'm going to test that and see how that works. Yeah, and a lot of times it's like, hey, why don't we pretend to buy a house? Yeah. You know, what? Or like I would say, like, you know, one of the things that a lot of my clients find of value is going through the process so they have a better understanding. And, you know, again, you want to make it, you know, I always kind of say that making an informed decision is a wise decision. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so yes. let me just you know, kind of present everything to you. Then from there, we can decide on whether this is the right thing for you to do or not. It could be that you don't, doesn't make sense for you to buy a house at this particular point. It's okay with me. You know, I've been doing this 19 years. I could wait another 19 for you to buy a house. Oh, I love that. I think that's a great way to end. Yeah. Let's go with the one final message. If you're a brand new agent, if you're a brand new agent, just get into the industry. What's the number? What's the quickest way for them to get their first transaction? What's the quickest way for them to get their first transaction? Um, I would say probably open houses um, if they don't go to a team that's providing leads, right? So if you don't go to a team that's providing leads, it's probably going to be open houses. It's going to be your best bet. Oh. And then and then it's learning how to have these conversations. So, again, we're professional sales athletes at our office, so we're practicing 15 to 25 hours a month. So I'll put my agents against any agents, no matter how long you've been in the business, because they know how to they know how to present they know how to have the correct conversations. I love that. They know how to uh, get after the lead a lot more than, you know, obviously for us, we're never satisfied, right? So we're always like, uh, we started with, you have to make 50 dials, 100 dials a week. Yeah. Then we went to 125. Then we went to 150. Now we're like at 200. Still not. Right? Good. Next Still month, possibly we'll be at 250. And then it's either you swim or sink. It's it's and it and it's not because I want you dialing. I want you to be successful in this business, and this is what it's gonna take. Well, not, and so let me ask you this. So I've always argued that the call number shouldn't be as important as the contact number. Correct. I think your contact number should be what you're aiming for. Okay.